Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Gage. I'm Director of Product Management at Oracle, and I focus on XLogic as a product, and I also work on the technology that underpins large-scale e-commerce applications. Um, the title of today's presentation is Building Large-Scale Web Apps with Oracle, and we will be focusing specifically on e-commerce. Uh, today we're going to be covering the changing e-commerce landscape, and we're going to talk just broadly about how e-commerce is, is changing. Uh, then we're going to be talking about changing customer expectations, uh, both for e-commerce and non-e-commerce workloads. We're going to be talking about how to scale. We're going to then talk about Oracle's solution. And then finally, we're going to talk about a case study. So let's discuss the changing e-commerce landscape. Uh, it used to be that when you would buy something as a customer, you would interact with just one single touch point. So you'd walk into a physical store, and you would do all of your research, your evaluation, uh, you might touch the product, uh, pick it up, ask how it works, uh, buy the product, and get support right there in a physical store. Or maybe you had a catalog, for example. If you're a retailer, you had a catalog and you know, all of your decision making would be based off of what was in that catalog. But today's world is very different. Uh, and this has only happened over the past few years as all of these new channels have emerged. So it, typically you start your research for a new product, for a new purchase. Uh, maybe it's in social media, for example, uh, or maybe it's uh, um, you know, on a, a website, for example. And then you talk about it, right? You talk about it with your friends, you talk about it in social media. Uh, you might walk into a physical store then and actually look at the product, only to return it to your house and then actually buy it. And then your, your post-sale support is also very different as well. So it used to be that uh, you know, all of your support was handled through a call center, for example, and you might mail the product in. Well, now customers want to be able to actually submit the product um, you know, back to you and return it in, in a physical store. And that's a very you know, different change. And what that's done is it's required that e-commerce as, as an industry and web apps in general allow customers to transact seamlessly across multiple distinct channels at the same time. So you might start an, an order at home and then go to a physical store, complete it, uh, and then uh, you know, show up at a repair facility in, uh, you know, in person to actually exchange it. And all of that has driven up uh, traffic substantially across all of these channels. So everybody's online more. Um, a recent study came out and said that 54% of all physical in-store transactions are now influenced by the web in some way. So all of this has really driven up traffic, and uh, it's made uh, life a lot more challenging for the designers of large-scale web applications and e-commerce applications specifically. Another problem is, is uh, traffic has gotten much more spiky than it used to be. So the graph shown here has traffic for e-commerce from uh, a large US-based retailer for the month of November. And this is in terms of page views. So if you see, you know, the majority of the traffic is, is very straightforward, right? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly low. Right, it's in the mid-teens in terms of percent utilization on an average basis. But sometimes it actually jumps up towards 70-80%. Right? It's, it, uh, you know, it spikes. And then on Black Friday, for example, it spikes up all the way to 100%. And we see this across the board. With social media, for example, when Michael Jackson died, he almost took down the internet because everybody went online to research Michael Jackson. And Google had lots of hiccups. But you know, this spikiness is, is very common, unfortunately. And what this involves typically is that everybody uh, take whatever their 100% traffic estimate is, and then they double that for safety. And then after they double that for safety, uh, then they add, say, 5x on top of that. So at any given point, the actual production environment is typically no more than 10 or 20% utilized, uh, and sometimes um, you know, even less than that at peak. Uh, steady state utilization is typically 1 or 2%. Right? It's very, very common. And all that overbuilding has you know, substantial consequences, right? When you have an environment with thousands of servers, it's very different to architect than an environment with just a handful of servers. So that's, that's been a very big change. Uh, also, if you look at how web applications are tested today, most of them have uh, ramp up periods. So you, uh, you, know, you, you add a, some virtual users to a, traffic, to, um, to a, 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 a given workload. Um, and then you have to they have a leveling period, right? So the, the server levels for a few minutes, and then you add a few more users. So it's a nice ramped, stepped pattern. And in reality, what you see is off to the left here, 
um, you know, f a, s a famous celebrity in social media who has 50 million followers happens to tweet a link to your website, for example, you know, your traffic can increase by several orders of magnitude uh, very, very quickly, within a minute or two. And that's not something that's commonly tested for. So that's a problem and it, it leads to a lot of inefficiencies. Uh, and also the number of access points is rapidly increasing. So it used to be that nobody had mobile phones that were capable of connecting to the internet. And even before that, people didn't have mobile phones. Right? Mobile phones are a relatively new invention. Uh, we also have tablets today. Uh, when Apple comes out with their long-awaited iWatch, we'll have an iWatch, for example. So we have many of these different devices that are each capable of connecting to the internet. And many emerging markets are skipping over desktops and everything else in favor of these new ways of, of accessing the internet. So all these new access points has really increased the amount of traffic because it makes it really easy to use the internet whenever and wherever you want as a customer. Uh, E-commerce and web applications in general are, are also very promotion heavy. So if you look at Black Friday, for example, Black Friday is a, a common example of uh, promotion driven traffic. Right? People offer, you know, uh, retailers offer 50% off uh, big ticket items. And that gets people just flooding in. I mean, look at all the deaths over the past few years from Black Friday sales because people are so eager to take advantage of these sales. And the same thing happens online, right? Uh, if there's a, um, a, a promotion that's been announced, people are constantly going online to look at, um, you know, at the prices, to look at the products, to do the research, and then ultimately to purchase. So that creates huge spikes in traffic that otherwise wouldn't be seen. Also, if you look around the world, e-commerce as a percent of total retail sales is still very small. So as I mentioned, 54% of total retail sales are driven by the web, but relatively small amount of traffic uh, of retail sales are actually uh, through the web at this point. So if you look at, you know, the global average is, you know, six, seven, eight percent today. Uh, in fully developed markets like South Korea, it's almost approaching 20%. And uh, if you look at markets like Spain, for example, and a lot of the emerging markets like India and even China, for example, you know, it's down in the single digits, low single digits. So there's a lot of room for advancement. And uh, you know, all of this is going online. And even if it's done, not transacted online, people around the world will use e-commerce much more to transact online. Uh, next, we're going to talk about changing expectations. So we, it used to be that uh, uh, people were just happy that they were pulling up the web page, right? People were connecting through dial-up, for example, and uh, you know, people were just happy that the page loaded at, at some point. But now that we've had the internet for a while and people are getting broadband and the technology has all improved, it's now increasingly, performance is increasingly important. So the New York Times came out with a fairly recent study that said 250 milliseconds, which is a quarter of a second, is now the competitive differentiator online. So that's the threshold at which somebody will leave your website and go to another website because the performance is, um, is so important. Uh, people are also getting fired for outages, and that never really used to happen. Um, you know, again, the, the e-commerce and web channels in general, websites were seen as kind of a side to their normal business. And if it went down, you know, people were upset, obviously, but you know, you probably wouldn't get fired. And now, what's happening is, is people are very clearly uh, getting fired, or they're getting very severe hits to their pay. They're not getting their bonuses uh, or anything. And and that is, uh, you know, given the ubiquity of the web and of e-commerce in general, um, that is very, very important now that people are um, that people keep the websites up. And that's driven a lot of uh, of our customers at Oracle and many others towards active, active architectures. And what that means is having a data center on each continent, for example, or one on each side of the US, and operating simultaneously from both of those data centers. So that if one goes down, all of the traffic gets seamlessly migrated over to the other one. Uh, and if you look at, you know, in the way that uh, software is provisioned, oftentimes it's provisioned too much um, or it's not provisioned enough. So if, if we look at the beginning part of this graph, uh, you know, when you don't provision enough, obviously there's an outage. But when you over provision, that's wasted capacity. So your goal should be to provision just enough that you're not, um, you know, that you're not wasting too much, but yet you still have enough headroom if there are ever any blips in traffic, for example. 
And this is what happens if you don't invest in your infrastructure. Right? You can have the nicest application in the world, uh, but you know, if you don't have basic infrastructure, right? if your dams don't work, if your roads aren't functioning, um, you know, th this is exactly what happens. So it's very, very important that you invest in the right in infrastructure and that you know, when you have that infrastructure that you actually are architecting your application and architecting your systems in a way that prevents outages and improves performance and things like that. So next we're going to talk about how to scale. Uh, we have a brand new white paper out on this and uh, it talks all about uh, how you scale with Exologic and our e-commerce offering and it covers a lot of uh, deployment architecture patterns and things like that. So I highly recommend that you, uh, you find that white paper. And you know, there, there are, before we talk about how to scale, it's really important to talk about the two types of scalability that exist. So when people talk about scalability, they just, you know, they say scale, right? But that doesn't really mean much by itself. And there are two layers here. So the first is vertical scalability. And vertical scalability is the ability of, to add more capacity by adding more uh, resources, right? So you have a resource which is considered an input and an output is considered something like HTTP request, for example. And when you have vertical scalability, you know, that, a classic example of that would be adding more hardware, upgrading the RAM for a, a single physical server, right? And that is very, very different than horizontal scalability. Horizontal scalability is adding another web server, for example, rather than bulking up a single web server. And you really have to do both, right? So you have to get a good amount of capacity out of each unit that you have. And a unit, again, is a web server. It might be a JVM. It might be a database node. Um, you know, it could be anything. It's very important to get very much, as much capacity as possible out of each one. But at some point, you hit diminishing returns where it makes sense to clone whatever that resource happens to be. So when you clone that resource, you, you can then hook it up to a load balancer and get you know, more capacity that way. But again, you know, both are good, both are required. Um, but when you talk about scalability, it's best to talk about horizontal or vertical um, when you have that option of being more specific. And, and this is what happens when you have a system that doesn't scale. Right? So if you look at the, the line that's at a 45 degree angle from the x and y axis, right? that's a linear scalability. So for every unit of input, it equals the same unit of output at any given level. So if you are at uh, the first server and you're getting, say, 25 page views per second per core, on your thousandth server, you should be also getting 1,000 page views per second, or sorry, excuse me, 25 page views per second per core. Um, that is what characterizes a, a scalable system. And there's a very big difference between this and throughput, right? You can have very poor throughput, right? Say you're only getting five page views per second per core, but you can have uh, very good scalability in that you always get five page views per second per core, whether you're at the first server or the 100,000th server, right? So that's a very important concept, and, and they're not um, mutually exclusive. Uh, again, you know, just to reiterate, this is uh, scaling up is the first graphic here. Scaling out, uh, also called horizontal scalability, is the second graphic. But what really matters when you scale out is that each additional unit that you add of hardware or of input, whatever that happens to be, you get the same output as well. Uh, this is our, uh, you know, caching more is very important, obviously. And it's important to cache as much as possible, as close to the client as possible. So you start with a client, and then you go through a, the internet, and then through a content delivery network, and then a load balancer, and then your application server, and then finally the database. Uh, you also have a cache grid that you can use, uh, and we have coherence for that. Uh, our application server, of course, is WebLogic. We have Oracle Database. For the load balancer, we have Oracle Traffic Director, and so on. But each one of these tiers are capable of caching. So it's important that you cache as much as possible as close to the client as possible, um, and that way, you know, a, a request that service from a system that is not on XLogic is one that you don't have to scale for. So, and it's also it performs better because it's closer to the client. So definitely do that if you can. You know, push things up towards the client, and make liberal use of caching because our products do fully support it. Uh, it also, we highly recommend using a write back cache. 
And what that is, you know, typically applications re um, write directly to the database. And when you do that, you have a coupling between the systems. So every request to the application server then requires multiple synchronous writes to your database. And doing that is good. Um, you know, it, it's the, the standard way of doing things, and it has been for, for decades now. But it also introduces uh, coupling, right? So if your database is down, your application is therefore obviously down. Uh, what's best instead is to use a distributed cache grid between your application server tier and your database tier. So you can use something like Oracle Coherence, put it in the middle between the two, and write to Coherence directly. Now, Coherence is a, is a distributed in-memory cache grid. You can commit to it within microseconds very frequently. You can co-locate the Coherence nodes with your application server nodes, and therefore you avoid latency. And then it's up to Coherence to keep the data coherent and to commit it back to the database, you know, the actual system of record at some point. And Coherence can then batch together the requests. Um, they can use various optimization techniques, and that substantially reduces the load on the database. And it also uh, removes that coupling, that very tight coupling. Uh, Coherence itself can also be very highly available. So you can have it uh, you know, write to two or more nodes every time you commit data, and that way you never lose data. But again, it depends on how much data loss is acceptable to you. Uh, let's go through some quick rules. Um, but I think the overarching rule is to use common sense, and this is something that is frequently overlooked. Um, but you know, think about what you're doing and um, make sure that you have good processes in place for reviewing and improving architecture and even coding as well. So it's very important that you do code reviews. And then once you do actually deploy the code into a test environment, take thread dumps and just make sure that there's no contention. Right? Remove as much contention as possible. So the first rule is to decouple, right? It's to, uh, synchronous calls are inherently scalability limiters because you're committing your data, um, you know, you're, you're having to wait in order to generate the HTTP response. Right? You're having to wait on the database, you're having to wait on all these other systems. So it's best to decouple whenever possible. Um, an example of that is, and this is fairly common in e-commerce, but it happens elsewhere, is uh, many people write their checkout page, right? So when you're about to place an order for something, so that when you click the confirm and place order button, it actually s synchronously sends the email to the customer saying that the order has been confirmed. And a lot of that's just sloppy coding, right? People don't understand that. Then that requires that the uh, email server be up. So for example, if the email server is down and you have a synchronous call, then your whole website's down and you lose any ability to make any money, right? It causes huge problems when you do that. So the smart way to do it is to dump those emails into an asynchronous queue, and maybe you want to do it with JMS, for example, and that way, whenever an order is submitted, it uh, you know, dumps the email in a queue and the email server is able to handle, uh, you know, is able to send that email asynchronously and substantially improve the overall throughput of the system because it can execute that work when it has time to work. Um, and also, it, it doesn't create that very, very tight coupling. So that's very, very important. Uh, it's also important to cache intelligently, as I mentioned. Uh, many of our e-commerce customers offload 90 plus percent of their page views directly to the content delivery network um, or a load balancer, for example. But if you think about e-commerce traffic in general and most web traffic, most of it's for the same stuff, right? It's for the anonymous homepage. It's for the footer, for example, which never changes. It's for the header. So you can cache a lot of that content out somewhere else whether it's at a load balancer or whether it's at a content delivery network or whatever it happens to be, you can cache that somewhere else and then you can uh, you know, only make calls back to get the dynamic content when you actually need it. So you know, definitely cache as much as possible. Uh, it's also very important to build in redundancy. Right? So things happen to data centers that uh, you, know, you wouldn't expect. So I've had customers who have had people with backhoes um, you know, take out entire data centers because they hit the power line, or they uh, uh, got rid of the, they hit the uh, internet connectivity, for example. Uh, sometimes it's natural disasters like hurricanes or floods or tornadoes that prevent um, anybody from y using data centers. So it's very important to have multiple data centers to operate either active-active or active-passive, and again, that depends on 
you know, what your tolerance is to downtime, right? Obviously, active-active has much higher SLAs than active-passive, but it comes at a cost. And put those data centers in different physical locations. So you might want to put, uh, you know, one data center in California, which obviously is uh, susceptible to, uh, vol to um, earthquakes and things like that. Um, but then again, on the East Coast, you have, uh, you know, you're susceptible to hurricanes. Now, it's incredibly unlikely, it could always happen, but it's incredibly unlikely that you're going to get an earthquake and a hurricane hit, the, hit your two data centers at the same time. Um, but you will at least guard against things like, um, you know, if you have a power outage, for example, in the region, right, you will definitely um, reliably guard against that type of disaster. So again, it, and it doesn't have to be limited to two. We have customers that do three data centers or even four data centers where they'll have one on each continent and they'll operate simultaneously from all of them. So again, that's very important to do depending on your requirements for availability. Uh, it's also very important to plan, and this is obviously something that's overlooked, uh, but you know, come up with a plan for how you plan to scale your application, have a very good architecture, make sure it's vetted, uh, you know, feel free to engage us at Oracle, we'd be happy to support you uh, as you define your architecture. But do that, and then also make sure that you stick to your plans, uh, that's very important. Uh, and then also do, as I mentioned, uh, code reviews, do ongoing periodic architecture reviews, but you know, just make sure that you're, you have a plan and that you actually stick to it. And then also just make sure that you, uh, you know, leverage us where appropriate. Uh, we've been doing large-scale e-commerce and large-scale web applications uh, for decades now. Uh, it's, uh, it's core to our um, product offerings and it's something that people like me, uh, it's our job to make sure that e-commerce and large-scale web applications run exceptionally well on Exologic and the rest of the Oracle stack. So this is uh, you know, a very big area of focus for us and we are happy to support. And as I mentioned, you know, this is Oracle solution. So we can start at the top here. We have Oracle Traffic Director and this is an Exologic only hardware accelerated software load balancer. Uh, and we go all the way down to Enterprise Manager for the management stack. But what's in common here is Exologic, um, Exadata, and uh, this combination has proven to work exceptionally well for large-scale web applications. Um, and then going down the stack, we have uh, H Oracle HTTP server for the web server. <coughs> we have, for searching capabilities, we have Oracle and DECA, which was a, an acquisition. We have ATG for e-commerce. Uh, we have WebLogic for the application server. We have uh, Oracle uh, Hotspot and Oracle JRocket for the JVMs. You can choose. Um, which one you want. You have, um, uh, of course, uh, Solaris as the operating system, but we also have Linux as the operating system. So we have choices all up and down the stack, but I think what's important to note is that we as a company take this market segment very seriously and we do substantial testing behind the scenes to make sure that all of these products work exceptionally well and they work exceptionally well for large-scale e-commerce and large-scale web applications in general. Uh, and let's uh, talk quick about what Exologic is, um, in, case, uh, in case you don't know. It's our engineered system, which is a combination hardware-software platform. It has between 4 and 30 x86 compute nodes, and uh, everything is inside the physical rack is connected with InfiniBand. So we have, uh, you know, InfiniBand is the basis, but on top of that we have uh, drive drivers and firmware and other intellectual property, and together that's called Exabus, which is our uh, management system on top of, um, or which is our uh, high-speed InfiniBand based backplane. And then on top of that we have uh, 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 storage, uh, Sun ZFS storage appliance. We have a management system through our management network and that allows us to do integrated lights out management for example. Um, you know, we have uh, uh, HCAs, InfiniBand HCAs as I mentioned. And then on top of that, we have a software stack. So we have uh, Oracle Linux or Oracle Solaris, both of which have been modified for the hardware. Uh, we have uh, you know, WebLogic, of course, which has you know, been modified substantially to work with Exologic. We have, uh, and then our application. So if you wanted to deploy ATG for e-commerce, if you wanted to deploy Web Center sites for uh, non-e-commerce large-scale web applications, you can do that. And all of these applications have been substantially modified for Exologic. 
So this is the software stack. So as I mentioned, we start at the base with Exabus. And then on top of that, we layer on Oracle VM. And Oracle VM is a, uh, it's a Zen derivative. That's an implementation of Zen, but it's Oracle's implementation. And uh, we've substantially modified that to work exceptionally well with InfiniBand and with our Exabus technology. And the advantage of that for large-scale web applications is uh, when you have those rapid spikes in traffic, you don't get your I.O. backplane saturated. Right? You'll never saturate your network or anything else because there's so much bandwidth available inside the physical rack. Uh, it also improves your scalability by improving your throughput. So you can have many, many page views per second per core, uh, dozens uh, all the way up to 100 or more, depending on the application. And that's because the requests, the HTTP requests, are serviced uh, usually sub 100 millisecond. So we can even get down to 50 milliseconds. And because the requests are not tied up uh, making HTTP requests, uh, you know, the requests are serviced so quickly, you can pack more HTTP requests on a given thread. And then when you multiply that across an entire server, you get much higher throughput for a physical server. Uh, and then you can do both horizontal, so that's the vertical scalability side. Horizontal scalability is also very good, where you can just increase the number of applications you have, um, you know, one after the other. Um, you can just, you know, copy it out, and uh, you get the same level of throughput at, at each given um, level of input. Uh, and this is a proof of concept we did for a customer, just to show you. So that red bar on the very bottom uh, across the x-axis is um, it's in direct comparison to the uh, the other one, that, the one that in increases exponentially. Um, so the red bar, is, of course, is Exalogic X is data with WebLogic, and the other one is our uh, customer's original environment, which was IBM P series, and it was running WebSphere. But the application was the exact same, and what this measures is the response time for a given set of scripts. So there's a number of scripts. Uh, most of them have about 12 steps. And that's, uh, you know, for example, a script is viewing the home page and then clicking on a product detail page, adding to cart, registering, and then proceeding through checkout. That might be one of them. Another one might be a uh, customer comes to the home page and bounces. So the average time it took to execute all of these is what you see across the, uh, the x-axis, or across the y-axis, excuse me. And on the, across the x-axis is the number of concurrent virtual users. But, uh, you know, as you can see, we have very, very good both horizontal and vertical scalability. And as you continue to throw traffic at the system, uh, it, the response times stay very, very consistent. Uh, and that brings me to our case study. So we'll be uh, talking about a very successful customer of ours in Brazil. It's called, uh, they're called Netshoes. And they're the largest online athletic retailer in the world. So they sell everything. They're kind of like... Uh, uh, are Zappos and Amazon combined in Latin America. And they have operations in Brazil, that's their biggest market, but also Argentina and Chile and Mexico and other countries as well. Primarily they sell sporting apparel, so uh, you know obviously they are very into football or soccer there. And they sell jerseys, uh, many of them personalized, they sell shoes, they sell electronics, they sell lots of different things. But uh, they've managed to, uh, they have a very, very successful business, and they've been running ATG now for, since 2009. Um, they bought Exologic, and uh, they've been very, very successful with Exologic, um, and they, they bought it because they're hosting the World Cup and the Olympics this summer. And based on their current growth rate, they just weren't able to scale. They were having constant outages. It just, it wasn't a very good situation for them. So after they bought Exologic, they went from between 30 and 40 servers, depending on how you count it, down to one half rack of Exologic. And of that half rack, they only used half of that. So they only used a quarter rack of Exologic, which contains eight compute nodes. And that powered their entire platform, top to bottom. Uh, in terms of instances, they went from 103 JBoss instances down to 16 WebLogic instances. And that's a result of two things. First, the throughput improvement was quite substantial. But in addition to the throughput improvement, the uh, web, uh, Exologic with WebLogic allowed for much larger JVMs. So they went from having a ratio of roughly two or three cores per JVM to a ratio of roughly four or five cores per JVM. 
So by increasing the number of cores per JVM, they were able to have fewer JVMs. And then launch itself only took three weeks. Uh, much of that was uh, you know, just sitting around and waiting for them to go live. Um, so that went very well. And uh, they've been a very, very happy customer ever since then. And they've recently purchased Exadata. They doubled their Exalogic investment. And uh, you know, they've been very happy with it. Uh, they've been so successful, in fact, that they were the only retailer to um, not go down for Black Friday. So that was a special event of theirs. Black Friday is very big in Brazil, and they, weren't, uh, they didn't have any outages, which they were really happy about. It also frees up their marketing staff to run campaigns. So they're able to run social media campaigns and other campaigns that before would have brought down the site. So their marketing group was always very concerned about not running campaigns um, or you know, being aware of how many people that would drive to the platform. And now they're in the situation where you know, the campaigns are, they can run whatever they want because they don't have to worry about the site going down anymore. And as I mentioned, uh, Netshoes has, was the only large retailer in Brazil to not suffer an outage over Black Friday, which they were very, very pleased about. And uh, you know, it's because of this that they increased their Exologic investment uh, for the Olympics and the World Cup, which are both expected to drive substantial traffic to Netshoes. So with that, I conclude today's session. I uh, thank you for joining us today, and I hope you learned something about large-scale web applications and e-commerce more specifically.